Another uh, paradigm I want to show you is how an envelope, a non-envelope virus uh, gets out of the endosome. So here is adenovirus. Remember, this is binding to cell receptors by these fiber receptors here. They're taken up by endocytosis. They end up in an endosome, and as you know, the pH drops in an endosome. With adenovirus, as the pH drops in the endosome, the particle begins to disassemble. As you can see, the pieces are falling off. The fibers come off at low pH. And then there's another protein which is usually buried in the capsid. It's shown here by these diamonds, these yellow diamonds. At low pH, those proteins come out of the capsid, and those poke holes into the endosome membrane. They lyse the endosome membrane, as you can see here, and the partially disassembled capsid gets out. So it's partially disassembled. It's not all disassembled, so it's still somewhat intact. It can then get out. It rides down the microtubules to the nucleus, docks onto a nuclear pore, and puts its genome in, in the nucleus. So a unique strategy for getting out of the endosome. You make a toxin or a, a, a protein that pokes holes in it. <clears throat> and again, you have to hide that protein in the intact virion so it doesn't act in the wrong place. Here's a, a very nice EM <clears throat> of an adenovirion moving down uh, a microtubule in a cell. You can see the particle there. There's a microtubule. And here is an EM of two adenoviruses, uh, this one sitting on a nuclear pore complex. So this is docked onto the complex and about to put its uh, uh, DNA into the nucleus. So this makes sense to you because you know that the virus with a double-stranded DNA most likely has to get its DNA into the nucleus. And there it happens right there. And that's where it has to be transcribed and replicated. Now there is another strategy for getting out of um, an icosahedral capsid uh, exemplified by polio. And the, what we're doing here is we're making a pore in the capsid and the RNA is coming out of the pore. So when poliovirus binds its receptor, that interaction is enough to get the RNA out of the pore. If you mix poliovirus with, it, with its purified receptor at 37 degrees, the RNA will come out. So apparently the receptor is enough to trigger some conformational change. It, triggers the spring in the virus that's loaded that lets the RNA out. So re remember, if the receptor isn't on a cell, this will not happen. So this is the control that the RNA will only come out in the right cell type. So what we think happens is the virus binds its receptor and is quickly taken up into a vesicle and very close to the cell surface, uh, the RNA is then ejected from the particle. Now getting out of the particle is easy because the receptor alone can do that. But then you have to get across the membrane, right? Because you have to have some kind of a, a passageway. And we're, we think this happens uh, when the virus itself makes a pore. So here's a close-up view of, a, of poliovirus bound to its receptor. Here are two receptor molecules that are fitting into uh, the canyon uh, and the particle. Now, if you remember from last time, I told you there was a, a molecule of lipid uh, in, the, in the capsid. And in fact, that's what these curly molecules are here. When the receptor sits down into the capsid, it pushes out the lipid. The lipid leaves, so now the pocket here is empty. And that gives the capsid the room to move. It undergoes conformational changes. And two hydrophobic sequences that are normally hidden, these blue sequences, now they come out and make a hole or a pore in the membrane. So really, this is all familiar, right? Because you're hiding the fusion proteins in the interior until they're needed. And what's the signal for them being needed? The right receptor that sits down and pushes the lipid out and allows those fusion peptides to come around. Now this lipid can be taken advantage of as, as an antiviral. In fact, there, there is a series of antiviral drugs that were selected by their ability to push the lipid out of that pocket. Let's go back one slide. Here's the lipid sitting in here. The receptor pushes it out. A series of antivirals were developed that displace the lipid and fit in here so tightly that the receptor can't displace them. And this is an example of such a compound bound in the pocket where the lipid would normally be. And this displaces the lipid pushes the lipid out, and it binds with such high affinity that when this virus now sits on a cell receptor, uh, 
it can't uncoat its RNA. So that's why it's an antiviral compound. Here's another view of the lipid sitting in the, the viral. This is one of the viral subunits uh, of the capsid. Uh, the receptor would be fitting in right here above it and would push the lipid out. If the antiviral drug is there, it can't push it out because it binds with too high affinity. Uh, the reason we know all this is because these drugs have been used to study virus entry extensively. They are worthless as antivirals, unfortunately, because as soon as you treat people with them, you get resistance. It's very easy to get single amino acid changes uh, in, the, in the pocket here that exclude the drug from binding. So even though they're a failure clinically, they've been great for telling us how uh, these viruses get into cells. Here's a, um, a crystal structure, an x-ray structure of poliovirus with these drugs bound to it. All right, so the yellow is each drug bound in the pocket just below where the receptor would be binding. And remember, there's 60 receptor binding sites per capsid. There are 60 drug binding sites per capsid as well. This is all predicted by icosahedral symmetry. So here, for example, is a five-fold axis of symmetry. You can see one, two, three, four, five kind of copies of the protein around that five-fold axis. And there are five copies of the drug bound uh, in the pocket around it as well. <clears throat> I want to tell you one example of uh, the, uh, a co-receptor or a second protein that's required for infection. And this goes back to Coxsackie virus, uh, which uses this molecule called CAR. Now, Coxsackie viruses uh, use two receptors to get in cells. They use CAR, which is the one shared with adenovirus. And they also use another protein called DAF. Now, Coxsackie viruses, like many other viruses, initiate infection at epithelial surfaces, respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract. But CAR is not on the surface of the epithelium. CAR is a tight junction component. It's buried in here. But it's necessary for virus infection. So how does the virus bind to it if it's located in here? Well, that's where DAF comes into play. It turns out that DAF is present on the apical side of epithelial cells. So DAF is up here. CAR is here in the tight junction. When Coxsackie virus binds to DAF, it starts a signal transduction pathway. It starts to signal through kinases and adapter molecules, and that ends up loosening up the cytoskeleton of the cell and loosens up the tight junction. So basically, virus binding to DAF loosens up the tight junction so the virus can now move into it and bind to CAR. Isn't that brilliant? So the Receptor is inaccessible, so instead the virus has evolved to bind to a cell surface molecule, and that binding loosens up the tight junction. So that's why Coxsackie viruses need uh, two receptors. And finally, um, the entry of real virus is worth mentioning, because this is an illustration of a virus that never really uh, gets rid of its RNA from the capsid. So real viruses are double-stranded RNA-containing viruses. They have a double icosahedral shell. They bind a receptor. They're taken up by endocytosis. Now, where most viruses will leave the endosome as the pH drops, because remember, um, at the end of the endocytic pathway, what happens to an endosome is it fuses with a lysosome, right? And that's full of proteolytic enzymes and nucleases, and most viruses want to get out before the lysosome steps. So that's why low pH gets them out. However, real viruses stay there. They are gluttons for punishment. Uh, they stay in all the way to the end, and what happens is the enzymes in the lysosome digest away the outer capsid of real virus. But the virus doesn't mind because it's got a second capsid below it, right? The first one is stripped off. The second capsid is there. That second capsid is very hydrophobic, and it just punches right through uh, the wall of the lysosome. Brilliant, right? So that's why this virus has two concentric shells, because the second one is left after the digestion, and that gets it into the um, cytoplasm. Now, mRNA synthesis then occurs in this core, in this core particle that's left. The genome is still in there and never gets out. We'll talk more about that next time, but the, the RNA synthesis then occurs in here, and the mRNAs come out so they can be translated uh, in the cytoplasm. It's really, really a brilliant uh, strategy.